right, so Genesis uh, chapter 13 is where we left off. Oops. We're looking at um, characters in the Old Testament, basically, and <laughs> seeing how their lives um, compare with ours and how we can learn from them, see how God operated um, in the lives of the Old Testament saints and um, how that can apply to us as well. Uh, so we just uh, finished with um, uh, Abram receiving the call from God. He's moved into an area. He's, he's built one altar. We talked about how it's important for us to, at times that we meet God, to build those altars, not necessarily a pile of rocks, but, you know, making, marking those things down in our calendar, in a journal, in, a, uh, in our mind, you know, those times of remembering so that when we're going through difficult times and we're having stuff happening in our lives, we can remember the promises God made us, the times he's met us, uh, the victories he's given us, those types of things. Um, uh, then, um, you know, they, there's a famine. He goes to Egypt and um, tells the... Uh, He goes to Egypt, tells Pharaoh that Sarah's his uh, sister, and of course um, she's so beautiful that Pharaoh takes her as a wife and then um, finds out what's happening, does the dude, what's up with that, and um, sends Abram on his way. Of course, he's prospered quite a bit there in Egypt, and uh, it's kind of, again, a uh, a parallel of what happens to the Israelites remember when they go into Egypt and even though they become slaves and everything when they go to leave they ask for gold and silver and all that stuff and they have so much stuff that when they start building the tabernacle they're able to donate to the point where Moses and Aaron and that leaders are just like okay you're given enough we don't need any more gold and silver wouldn't how many churches today would like to have that happen <laughs> we're having a fundraiser whoops okay you guys gave enough stop we don't need any more. Um, but anyway, so that's how much they have. So they, even though they are slaves, they leave rich. Um, even though Abram lies to Pharaoh and really should have paid some kind of price for it, he ends up prospering and, and being blessed. And so he leaves with more stuff than he had before. So uh, chapter 13, so Abram uh, went up from Egypt to Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and silver and gold. Uh, and from there, he went from that place to place until he came to Bethel, uh, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. So Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, but the land could not support them. While they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herd and the herdsmen of Lot, and the Canaanites and Perzites were also living in the land at the time. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have this quarreling between you and me, and between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And so here you see him coming out with so much stuff. Um, and remember, you know, wealth at that time is going to be measured a lot by the size of your herd. Um, John has cows, so sometimes wealth might be measured by the size of the herd or <laughs> the blessings of God from that. But um, they would have, you know, the uh, camels and donkeys and uh, the um, goats and uh, all the all the different things that they had, and and they would see how wealthy they were by by all of that. And so Lot's wealthy, Abram's wealthy, and of course he gained a lot while he was in Egypt. And they've got so much, you know, um, how much land does it take for one cow for food? What do they say? Five acres. Five acres. So five acres for one cow. So you can imagine. He's got camels and donkeys and sheep and goats and, you know, all these different animals. You can imagine it would take a pretty big area for all these animals to be able to graze. <clears throat> and everybody knows goats know how to really graze, right? <laughs> They'll eat anything, right? That's the old uh, joke. You know, you see the goat chewing the old tin can or whatever. It's just like they'd eat anything. Um, and so... 
with Lot having a bunch of them, Abraham having a bunch of them, you can just imagine how not only would it be hard to support them, but they also have to spread out quite a bit, right? I mean, they got to take over a lot of land. So even though Abram's right here with his main group of people, he's got servants, he's got herdsmen, he's got all these individuals spread out all over this land, uh, taking up a huge area. And uh, how many of you know when it comes to uh, getting to the fresh water and taking care of the flocks and things like that, that it'd be pretty common for herdsmen to, to quarrel? I mean... You just you just are. You want the easiest place to water them. You want the easiest place to feed them. You just want. I mean, you know, why make your work harder? <laughs> I want to keep them in the best areas. And so they're fighting. The herdsmen are fighting. And and Abram sees this. And Abram decides. You know, we need to do something about this. So he goes to Lot, and he says, "Okay, you know what? We shouldn't be fighting." Now they weren't necessarily fighting, but their people were. Um, those that were under each of their households were, and so Abram's like, we can't have this. Um, let's let's deal with it. Let's take care of it. And here's here's the plan. You go and you look and you figure out where you want to be. And if you go that way, I'll go this way. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. You know, if you go up, I'll go down. You know, whatever. You go wherever you want to go, and I'll go to a different place. Um, how how many of you know that's a really noble way to do it? Amen. Because he was the one that was leading, he was the one that was moving, and Lot came with him, it would be very easy for him to have the right to say, this is my choice, this is my call, this is where I'm going, so here's what you're going to do. I'm going to go here, and wherever I go, you go the opposite way. But he didn't do it that way, did he? He's like, he's giving Lot the choice of where he wants to go, and he's going to go very, very noble, very much a way in which he can show us how to be a leader right um, not using our leadership to get the best for us or to make sure we get everything but to use our leadership to help bless those that are following us and that are with us and that's a principle we can take from that and so lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the jordan was well watered like the garden of the lord like the land of egypt toward zor and was before the Lord, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan, set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. <laughs> and so here's Lot's assessment of things. He looks out. And he sees a place that is so well watered, so green, so lush with life. They even, in the Bible here, compare it to the Garden of the Lord. How many of you know what garden that is? Right? Garden of Eden. <laughs> um, or the plains of, uh, of Egypt. And the reason that that land there in Egypt would be so rich is because the, uh, the river, the Nile, would overflood in the springtime and it would bring in all the nice silt and, and good uh, fertilizer and moisture and then it would come back down and, the, and it was just rich, rich land. Um, and they were able to grow there without any problems and also being close to the water so that uh, you didn't have, you know, you, we didn't, they didn't have a lot of the um, pumping stations and, um, you know, running water like we had. They would do more irrigation ditches and different things like that. And so if you weren't close to water, it could be hard to water your, your crops. And here, here it is, man. It's just right there. Everything's ready to go. And he doesn't look at the fact that Sodom's there and that those people are really wicked. As a matter of fact, he ends up gravitating toward the city, right? Why do you think he built his tent close to Sodom, close to the city, close to the populated area? Anyone want to hazard a guess at that? You got this whole area and you got all these herds and you got all this stuff. Why would you want to be close to the city? I can think of lots of different reasons. Anybody want to hazard a guess? There's no right or wrong answer because the Bible doesn't tell us. I'm thinking human nature. I'm thinking it'd be really convenient to go buy things. You're close to the city, close to the market. You know, whatever it is you want to buy, I don't know. Different kinds of foods, drinks, fermented things, who knows. Uh, 
Uh, I know uh, Lot didn't have a problem drinking. Later we see his daughters get him drunk. You know, it's going to be another story at another time, but they wouldn't be able to get him drunk if he didn't like a little bit of fermented drink. So, you know, close to the city for that. Um, I don't know. Maybe they had some good gambling tables. Prostitutes? I don't know. I don't know how where Lot was at. The Bible says he was a righteous man, but he was vexed by the wickedness of Sodom. But I would say the reason that he would be close to the city is because it's just convenient to go and, and get things. He's got money. So maybe he wanted to, maybe he just wanted to buy some fancy artwork or he liked going to the shows. Maybe he liked Broadway and they had a good good theater company there. Or, you know, they had the best concerts. I don't know. But but he, he wanted to be close to the action, wanted to have access to those things. And, um, you know, in, in our life, one of the things could be with that is, you know, are we living in our lives in a way that's close to access to things of the world because we hunger for the things of the world? Uh, why wasn't Abram worried about those things? Why was Abram in the land of Canaan? Because he was more worried about the call of God, the promises of God, and what God was taking him to. And he was walking in the promises of God, so that stuff wasn't important. Lot wasn't walking in those promises, didn't even have those promises, wasn't worried about it, and so he's wanting to be close to the things of the world. Um, and we could take that as a, as a principle in our lives. Do we want to be close to the things and have access to the things of the world? Or are we more caught up in the promises of God, the direction of God, where he's going, his kingdom? You know, what is God doing in his kingdom today? Are you paying attention to what he's doing in his kingdom, and are you able to be a part of it? Do you want to be a part of it? Are you seeking first what? Seek ye first the kingdom, the kingdom of God, right? His kingdom is alive and active in the world. Are you part of what his kingdom is doing in the world? Because his kingdom is doing something. It's moving. It's a new day. It's a time. Are you part of that action? Are you part of that activity? Are you part of it? Are you looking for it? Are you seeking it? Because I'll tell you what, if you're not seeking it, you're probably not going to find it, right? Uh, if you're not striving to enter in, Jesus says many will try and not make it, but you got to strive to enter into that narrow gate. Um, are you actively involved? Because it's very easy for us to get to the point where we think, okay, well, I've got my fire insurance. I've got, you know, I know I'm where I'm going to go when I die, so I don't really have to worry about much in this world. No, we should still be seeking first his kingdom. We should be seeking first his righteousness. We should be striving to enter into that narrow gate. We should be partaking in what he's doing in our area and our communities. Um, are we? Are we even paying attention or are we just asleep? I would say most people are asleep or basically dead. But that's a message for another time. Um, so here's Lot, and he's, and he's got this, uh, uh, ends with verse 13, just talking about Sodom and how wicked they were, and how they're sinning greatly against the Lord. But that doesn't bother Lot, the fact that it's wicked, the fact that they're sinning. Um, how many know if a city's really, really wicked, it's going to be known for being wicked, right? There, there's a city in America. Uh, it's called Las Vegas. What's another name for Las Vegas? You know what it is? It's, uh, Sin City. Sin City? <laughs> Is that because of all the righteous things that happened there? <laughs> it's, because, sure. it's because they're known for their wickedness. Um, and, and for good reason. You know, prostitution's legal there. California is getting this bad. Yeah, oh yeah, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. And it's burning. <laughs> okay, so anyway, there's that wicked place. So, uh, verse 14, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, lift up your eyes from where you are and look north, south, east, west, all the land you, that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that anyone, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. And Abraham moved his tents and went to live near the great trees uh, at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. And so now that Lot's left, God comes to him and he's like, look, look everywhere. 
north, south, east, west. Look all around. As far as you can see, this is the land I'm giving you. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to your descendants. Um, and as a matter of fact, there's going to be so many descendants that you're going to have that people won't even be able to count them. They'd have to be able to count dust, grains of sand on the sea, you know, to, to be able to count your descendants. Uh, what a powerful promise. And don't you know, that would be a hard one to believe if you don't believe in God because there's all kinds of people in the land, right? There's the Perzites, there's the Hittites, I think they mentioned, the Canaanites, there's different ones they mentioned. Here's all these people, there's there's these big cities like Sodom and Gomorrah, there's all these places, um, you got all these people. And not only is he saying all that's going to be yours and your descendants, but also the fact that he's saying it's going to be his descendants and there's going to be a lot and he hasn't had any children yet, right? And he's getting older. People aren't living as long as they were just in his father's time um, and the time before that. And he's going, man, I'm pretty old. My wife's not that young. And what about all these descendants? You know, the, how many of you know if you've been married like 50 years and you haven't had any kids? You're probably not thinking about kids. <laughs> I know for Sylvia and I, we were trying for nine years and hadn't had any kids and going, man, and we were wanting to and not. And of course, they were wanting to, right? And going, man, I don't know. It may not happen. This is, this is you know, we're calling out on the Lord. Of course, he did bless us with with two, but um, that was one. Nine years was a long time. I couldn't imagine. They, they, they's been going a long time, decades, no children. Um, and so that'd be a hard promise to accept, but Abraham believes God and he builds another altar there and he's going to accept God's promises. If he, if he's building this altar after God speaks to him, that's one of the ways that he is showing that he's accepting his promise. Um, and, and there's ways we can show it in our lives. If he gives us a promise, if he gives us direction, do we change direction? Do we move forward with that promise? Do we accept the fact that do we start, you know, for Abram, does he start building a crib? You know, does he start start building a room, a nursery, and putting the the little little uh, uh, clowns on the wallpaper or whatever you put in the kids' room? I know clowns are, all, are scary, but uh, <laughs> whatever. Trees and monkeys. <laughs> trees and monkeys. Yeah, do some trees and monkeys on the wall. Something. Um, is he starting to go? Okay, God said it, so I'm going to believe it. Um, and of course, even at this, Abram might not not even be thinking it's going to be. A birth of a child maybe it's going to be an adopting maybe it's going to be you know through a concubine we see they try later maybe it's going to be something like that maybe it's going to be a servant he may not even be fully accepting the fact that it's going to be from his very loin uh, but maybe it's some different way something God has planned and I know like for Sylvia and I we we're at the point where we we're ready to adopt if we had to or something like that and just um, accept some other other means um, so then there's this um, this battle, uh, a bunch of kings um, uh, do this thing, and they, they battle, and they take the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah, um, and they capture him, and they capture Lot, um, and uh, you can go down, just kind of laying it all out in chapter 14, go down to like verse 11 of 14. Uh, the four kings seized all the goods of Sodom, Gomorrah, and all their food, and they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. And, uh, let's see, this one's want to beep at me. Just an experiment, so who knows? Um, so they they go and they capture Sodom and Gomorrah. They capture all the goods, and then since Lot was living in Sodom, it says so. Uh, it sounds like maybe he moved from his tent to buying a place in Sodom. So you go move close to the town of evil, access to the worldly things, living on the outside in the tent. But then at some point, you know, you go, well, this would be a lot more convenient if I just got a, a place inside the town. 
I'm just going to move into the place, get in into the world, and that's what happens when you dabble with the world's things. You may be on the outside at first, but eventually you're going to be moving into it and embracing it. Um, and that's what Lot ends up doing. Remember when uh, the angels come to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah later in Genesis, that Lot is living inside of Sodom. Um, so he went from the tent which wasn't maybe as comfortable as a nice apartment with air conditioning and all the things that it had. So, so now he's in Sodom, so he gets captured because he's there. <clears throat> and they capture all of his stuff. Um, and then so, someone that escaped um, came to Abram, and uh, they uh, uh, tell him about what happens. And in verse 14, when Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And during the night, Abram divided the men and attacked them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Damascus. Um, he recovered all the goods, brought back his relative lot, the possessions together with the women and the other people. And so as soon as Abram hears that his nephew is captured... How many of you know he's not worried about the king of Sodom and, and those people so much as he is? This is my nephew. This is blood of my blood. He takes 315 trained men. Isn't that interesting? He had 315 men that were of the right age and the right ability to be able to fight. How many of you know that's a pretty good-sized group of men? 315. If you guys found out your nephew was captured by a king, you got 350 men you could call up right away and go... <laughs> I don't think I do. I don't know. <laughs> I guess I'd have to find some people. But these are all individuals in that were born into his household. So these are like, you know, servants, different ones, herdsmen, wherever, whatever position they were in. But they were also trained to fight. They, they knew how to uh, battle. They were not um, amateurs in the ability to at least wield some kind of weapon or to do something. And so he was able to instantly call up 318 men. That's impressive. That, that gives you a little bit of perspective on how big of a group is with Abram, right? Because we read about Abram and Sarah, and we don't think about all these other people with them, all these big flocks and all these types of things. I mean, they, they were spread out over a large area. And here's 318, and he's able to go and win a victory from four kings that had come together and attack Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, that's pretty impressive. How many of you know his name's going to start to be talked about, <laughs> right? They're going to know who this guy is. Uh, people are going to talk about him. They're going to notice him. Uh, they're going to be like, whoa, he was able to overthrow all these kings. And so he gets all the possessions. He gets his relative back. And then uh, in verse 18, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine he was a priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And so, uh, well, and then let me read the next verse real quick. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. And so, they're traveling. Here's Abram. How many of you know Lot would have been close to Abram at this point, right? He just rescued him. How many know the king of Sodom is going to be close to Abram at this point because he just rescued him? He's the king, right? When you have leaders, individuals, uh, elders, those that are in positions of power, how many of you know they stuck close together in those times? You know, the kings would be together, the princes would be together, the elders would be together. And so they're going to be together, and then they meet Melchizedek, this high priest. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about him. Uh, it talks about him being a king of Salem, talks about him being uh, a priest uh, of the Most High God. Uh, Salem means peace, and talks about him in the New Testament, and there's some real interesting things that you can look in the New Testament on it as Jesus being a priest after the order of Melchizedek. But here's this individual that's a, a priest of the Most High God, and he's blessing Abraham. And as soon as he blesses Abraham, and he says, Abraham is being blessed by the God the Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and he blesses him and uh, just praises God for delivering the enemies to Abram. And then Abraham gives him one-tenth of everything, and the king of Sodom is right there. And I think this is significant and something that we overlook sometimes when we go through this story. Um, 
the king of Sodom would have been right there with him. As a matter of fact, as soon as this happens, the king of Sodom, he may have even been saying this in front of Melchizedek and, and Abram. He's saying, hey, you take, just give me the people and you take all the goods. And so he's hearing Abram being blessed. He's realizing, man, this dude just saved my life. He may be a little worried that Abram could kill him and take all the stuff anyway, right? I mean, that, in that time, those things happen. Um, and so he's just like, maybe if I just tell him, you know, take all the people, you can keep the goods, he'll let me live. Um, and, and I'm thinking there's a little bit of fear in him <laughs> saying, saying that, just hoping that maybe he's saving his life, thinking he may be facing death here. Um, he saw what Abram did with Melchizedek and giving him a tenth. Um, and he's, all, he's, he's in a way trying to even outdo him, right? Just take everything. <laughs> take everything, Abram. <laughs> Just let me live. But Abraham was not about to go with that. Um, Abram uh, knows better than to give people an opportunity to claim, claim credit for what God is doing. Um, God's blessing him. God's going to give him the land. If he takes this from the king of Sodom and Gomorrah, then people could say that it was him that made him rich. Um, and how many of you know, too, an individual that may be pleading for their life and they promise something later, once they get their life and they're back in their home, they may kind of renege on it. They may think, oh, wait, why did I do that? May get a little angry and bitter. Man, he took all my stuff. Why did he take all my stuff? You know, um, there, there's nothing good could come of it. Um, and so... Um, in verse 22, but Abram said, King of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God, most high, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath. I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or a thong of your sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me um, and let them have their share. And so Abram's like, no, I, this is my oath. I'm not going to take anything from you. This is my oath to God. And the reason I'm making this oath to God is so that you can't say you made me rich. God's the one that's going to make me rich. God's the one that's going to give me my blessing. I don't need any blessing from you. But... You know, the workman's worthy of his hire. You don't muzzle an ox that treads the grain. These guys that came and delivered you, you, you give them what they ate. You know, give them a fair share. Give them a little something for their troubles. Um, but I don't want anything. Um, and, and so that's the agreement. And, and one of the things that I think is significant about this with the king of Sodom being there with Melchizedek is he would have had a chance by seeing that to, to, and also seeing the oath God Abram's making it to the God, Most High, Creator of Heaven and Earth. Melchizedek, best of them in the name of God, Most High, Creator of Heaven and Earth. He would have had a chance to repent and say, man, I want to know this God, the Creator of Heaven and Earth, wouldn't you? I mean, look at the situation, what's going on. You know, here's this guy that, that saved us. He could have took everything we had. He could have killed us. He's not even taking anything. He's giving to this priest. This guy's talking blessings in him. And he's talking about the God that created everything. And there's something real about it. Something's happening here. The way I'm going didn't work too good for me. I got captured. <laughs> the way he's going is working pretty good. He rescued me. And he's still going to let me keep my stuff. He had a chance to repent. And how many of you know he didn't? <laughs> Later, they can't even find 10 righteous men in Sodom and Gomorrah. How many of you know some of the other people that were there? They know what happened. They were there. They know about Melchizedek. They were there. They know about this God, creator of Most High. They were there. The stories would have spread. And yet, in Sodom and Gomorrah, you didn't have any repentance. You didn't have a revival. Uh, you didn't have a bunch of people accepting. Um, and, and so, um, this is where I'm going to end for today. And then, because uh, uh, next week we'll go into uh, a vision that um, Abram has. Um, so, anybody have anything for what we covered today? So anyway, so those are some good principles, you know, the with Lot getting a little close to the world and moving into the world, um, that's something we need to watch in our lives. Uh, we could be believers, we could be starting on the right path, but man, we start getting close to the world, start envying, accepting, wanting those things of the world instead of the promises of God, 
Uh, it can lead us to, I mean, here's capture and facing death for Lot. I mean, you know, that would have been a good warning sign for Lot, too. Good time to move out after that, right? <laughs> you know what? Maybe, maybe this isn't the best place to be. You know, this isn't working too good. Um, uh, and then uh, the when we have an opportunity, we see God moving, we see God doing stuff, you know, to latch on to that and to move forward with that. If, if the king of Sodom, if the people of Sodom and Gomorrah had just paid attention to what was happening and the words that were spoken, man... Uh, it could have been totally different. Uh, what didn't have to be destroyed. Abraham had pled to the point where if there was just 10 righteous people, but no, not even 10 people uh, would uh, go to the Lord. And, and if you had, if Lot and his daughters and his wife were righteous at that time, that's four. There only would have been six people, but there wasn't. Wow. What a powerful thing. Um, all right. Go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for all you're doing. <clears throat> I ask, Father, that uh, you just bless the um, telethon tomorrow starting at 8 and uh, on Tuesday at 8 to 8. Um, you just bless um, what uh, is being done and uh, bring in the finances to help us to move forward to the next phase and the next level and to be that blessing to to your body and to your people and to the advancement of your kingdom and i ask lord that you'll just turn each of our hearts and minds to you more and more and that we'll learn from you and uh, be closer to you throughout this week uh, and to come back again next week and just celebrate your presence in jesus name amen